Hello, everyone. I'm Lou Zaccarella, a founder of the Intelligent Community Forum. Welcome back to our series, No Place But Home, conversations with leaders of the world's top seven intelligent communities and others about how they are tackling the coronavirus threat, how their people are responding, and how municipal and civic tools are being used in their effort to keep their communities informed, engaged, and working. It has been 127 days since the late Dr. Wenliang Li reported in his blog about a new pneumonia in his city of Wuhan, China. Uh, there were 80,000 reported cases uh, at that time. It has been 55 days since the World Health Organization declared this a global pandemic. The United States reports that there have been 72,024 uh, deaths since 11.30 a.m. Uh, this morning and this morning is May 6th, and there have been 257,906 deaths across the globe. We are recording this from New York on May 6, 2020. It has been 70 days since my state, New York State, issued its order to close all non-essential facilities. Here in New York, uh, there have been 25,386 deaths in the state uh, as of May 5th. In New York, the total daily number of coronavirus deaths was 230 on Monday, May 4th. That's under 300 again for the fifth consecutive day. So for us in New York, that's good news. There remain about 9,600 people hospitalized down from uh, nearly 20,000 at the peak. A panoramic view of the country, however, reveals a more distressing picture than the one we have. If you exclude New York now, it's a plateau slowly moving up. And it's not just major cities, uh, small towns and rural communities in the Midwest and South have suddenly been hit hard, underscoring the capricious nature of this pandemic. In the state of Ohio, where we are focused today, there have been 1,135 reported deaths as of about 24 hours ago. So we're gonna go to Hudson, Ohio, which in February was named to the list of the world's top seven intelligent communities for the second time at an event in Taiwan, which was uh, presided over by that nation's president. Among the reasons Hudson has performed so well over the last couple of years uh, is its chief economic officer. James Stifler is a 25 year resident of that city, but his work in Hudson is actually an encore to three decades as a very successful Wall Street executive uh, here in New York. So in addition to uh, attraction and retention, Jim, who is giving back in big doses to his city, provides strategic oversight to Hudson's rapidly growing uh, city-owned fiber optic broadband business. And he has worked with the city's leadership to expand and capitalize on what he calls the innovation bias that his homes of Hudson is blessed to have. Jim, welcome to No Place But Home. It's great to see you. Well, thank you, Lou. It's uh, it's a privilege to be here. I'm flattered to be asked. Uh, you know, you have a global pulpit, and uh, I uh, I take that very seriously. And uh, a friendly face like yours, you know, we Paul and I have often said, Chief Innovation Officer Paul Liedem and I, that is there a nicer, more accessible guy in the world than Lou Zaccarilla? So. Uh, your face is a, a sight for, for sore eyes uh, in times like this. And uh, I want to welcome everyone out there uh, around the world to, uh, to Hudson, Ohio. Um, and, um, you know, my thoughts are with you and everyone in New York. As you said, much of my career was tied to one of New York City's largest employers. And, um, you know, when I see pictures of empty streets in Manhattan and things like that, things that are you couldn't have imagined in your wildest dreams, uh, a city built on, you know, people being together. It's, it's, it's just shocking. So, you know, for all you've gone through, for all that lies ahead, uh, and for the incredible spirit of your home community there, you know, God bless everyone. Thank you, Jim. And do me uh, two things, if you will. Um, Tell us just a little bit about Hudson, um, although, as you say, it's been pretty prominent the last two years within our community around the world. And also just give us a snapshot of what's happening today in Hudson as it relates to the COVID-19 pandemic 
and how uh, you know how the city is responding. Well, we are um, 221 years old, so we're one of the oldest communities in Ohio. One of the most historic, you know, we're a stop on the Underground Railroad. We were settled by folks from Connecticut who came out and claimed the land and established the Connecticut Western Reserve. And today we're about 22,000 people. We're smack dab right between Cleveland uh, and Akron, so northeastern Ohio. And, uh, you know, uh, it, it, it puts us in a good spot between two decent sized cities. And that's certainly not the size of of New York or, or the size of some of the communities who might listen into this um, discussion. But, um, you know, it's a healthcare mecca. Uh, the fabled Cleveland Clinic is here. Um, they're elsewhere around the world now, Dubai, Florida, Las Vegas. Um, but I mean, in a pandemic, it's, it's great to have them um, nearby. Uh, our population's well-educated, uh, more fortunate than most. Um, but uh, because of those things, we're travelers too. So we came out of the blocks here uh, fairly early with um, incidences of COVID-19 in our community. In Summit County, where we reside as of yesterday, there have been about 744 cases uh, and about 60 deaths. Uh, the age range in our communities from three years old to 102 uh, for people that have tested positive. Um, slightly more uh, women than, than men. And in Hudson, um, the best numbers I have is we've had two to two and a half dozen cases. Now I say that because uh, it was controversial in Ohio with, uh, with residents, but uh, the state and the uh, county health departments did not list counts. You know, first of all, they weren't sure how accurate counts were early on and still aren't in terms of how many people might have this don't and actual causes of death where there weren't you know, investigations or autopsies. So, um, and they didn't want to panic the folks. Um, now they list by zip code. So, you know, for a city of 22,000 to have uh, 24 to 30 cases, it was kind of an eye catcher. Cause early on people thought, oh, this isn't us. You know, this is not gonna happen here. You know, we can, we can manage. And uh, I, I think it caught them by surprise, but then we fell into order pretty quickly. Um, the state of, um, Ohio has uh, Mike DeWine as, as governor, and he was early in saying, we got to get out ahead of this thing. I mean, he was so early, I think he surprised a lot of people. Um, today, the state has uh, succeeded in flattening the curve. We've kept our hospitals below capacity. Uh, some of the states are right around us, notably Michigan, to some degree Pennsylvania, have had a far worse go of this than we have. And so, uh, you know, Hudson, Hudson got on board and uh, I'm, I'm proud of them. Um, you know, in terms of uh, help and effort, we can talk about that in the course of our conversation today. But yeah. uh, I believe, you know, we've, we've done a good job and, uh, and, you know, we've moved into the recovery phase now and we only hope that we can, can keep this thing under control. Very good. Um, Jim, two questions. Again, uh, your primary challenge right now, as you seem to have been, you know, very successful at getting on top of it, bending the curve, and the the value, if there was one, of being, you know, near the Cleveland Clinic um, with regard to any collaboration that might have been useful, sharing of information. Well, um, let, let's address the clinic first, because I, I've said it several times, recently, um, I value the information I get from medical authorities uh, very highly and, um, and from uh, law enforcement as well. In an age of social media, there's so much rumor and innuendo and, and uh, opinion out there. Um, but I was talking to one of the leaders of the clinic late, uh, recently and, and uh, he told me that, you know, they had ordained their entire infrastructure um, around the notion that this uh, pandemic was going to be an issue until 2022. So their leadership, their thinking, their staffing, people's ancillary skills, their facilities, um, their action plans, you know, their strike forces, everything uh, has an 18 month, you know, forward looking window on it still. And uh, to me, that's, that's great information because if they don't know what's going on and they are not in the lead on these things, you know, um, who does and how can we be? 
and it, it cuts a lot of the noise away. And then in Ohio, the director of the Ohio Department of Health, uh, Dr. Amy Acton, has become um, sort of a, a superhero with her, her no-nonsense demeanor. I mean, you've had Governor Cuomo and his daily fireside chats. I mean, some of these people have, have really um, taken the public and, and captivated them with no-nonsense talk. So I think that's, that's been, uh, been highly um, valuable. Now our town, go ahead. Well, no, I was just gonna say, you, you make a key point, which is that in our case uh, here in New York, the governor in particular has been insistent that we get the facts. You know, he, um, you know, so just, just the facts. He actually put up a picture of Joe Friday from the old show Dragnet, which nobody, you know, probably younger than us remembers, but he puts it up all the time, just the facts. And, mm -hmm. and, and, and as you say, that has been comforting, yeah, at least to, yeah. to people like me. And I think New Yorkers have bought into the fact that if we can just look at the facts, even if it's bad news, uh, we can manage this crisis. And mm -hmm. I, I think like, like you, uh, you know, we've been able to literally get our hands on that curve and bend it through the force of will and, and facts. So, you know, I want to ask you, because you're a data-driven uh, person, that's, you know, again, one of the secrets to your success. How have you in Hudson been communicating with citizens in terms of um, this thing? And what adjustments have you had to make? Has there been more of an online uh, outreach? Have you had to do things to build trust that you may not have before this uh, had had to do? Well, one thing I learned in the private sector was that, you know, people have touch points or, or channels that they listen to. A channel may be the mailbox, a channel may be a public meeting or an employee meeting. It could be the internet, it could be a call center, it could be voice response. You know, in government, we have things like community television, um, you know, we have dusted all of these off and recast them. I think about your question, not just as residents, but how have I communicated with businesses? You know, we've got 800 small business or 800 businesses, and I would say 650 of them are small. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, we've had to think about the best way to reach these folks in every regard. And, uh, you know, the, the ascendancy of mediums like we're using today to talk uh, has just been, you know, phenomenal. You know, big corporate America has used, you know, video and Teams and Slack and Zoom for a few years, but this stuff is like Main Street America now. So we quickly co-opted that. Um, we, uh, you know, what strikes me here is that things like our town newspaper, um, which comes out on Wednesdays and Sundays, is this is such a fast make a fast moving you know daily breaking event that you know we're all living at real time and our residents are living at real time and suddenly you see a newspaper that has Wednesday's news in it and it's Sunday and that's 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 a harbinger I think of, of things to come um, so you know we took our uh, community television um, channels of which there are three and we recast them around this kind of information entirely and took a lot of the traditional stuff down temporarily. Um, we've been using a, um, uh, a hard copy, two to three page focus on Hudson newsletter that goes to 8,000 mailboxes because uh, snail mail still has a place, you know, in this world in terms of, um, in, those, in those editions have a single focus, a single, single message or theme. Um, how, often that, how often is that going out, Jim? Uh, those are generally once a month. Um, but as we've moved from relief into recovery now, the next one is planned. You know, here's our recovery efforts, or here's, um, here's our projections for budget declines. Uh, here's how we're going to fill in that hole. Okay, here's where the money's going to come from. So, um, you know, all of our board meetings and uh, council meetings and, you know, approvals, uh, zoning meetings, planning commissions, everything are done like we're talking now. And honestly, I think they're better than the fixed cameras, stationary high on a wall in a room. You can see people's reactions. You can see them, feel them thinking. You can read their body language. I don't think we, we should go back. We've built websites just around this topic. We've married our city websites around the topic and our resources to the Chamber of Commerce, to the Merchants of Hudson, to our Travel and Tourism Bureau, 
So things that you would have talked about for weeks and months and debated whether they were doable have suddenly just happened, yeah. you know, by, by force. That's, that's outstanding, I think. It's really interesting, yeah. And, and, and it, as we were talking offline earlier, it probably will also change the course of government and how government business is being conducted. And if we're lucky, uh, reinforce the trust that people have in government, local government especially, during a time like this. So uh, that, that's probably the good news. Uh, you know, you mentioned uh, the Hudson's very, very high educational attainment levels. Uh, one area where you seem to excel and shift quickly was to that going to an online school format. Now, that just didn't happen tactically as a result of this. Uh, we know you guys have been working on this kind of stuff for at least three years. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about that? Well, we're fortunate here. One of the things that's made Hudson, I think, and, and put us on the map uh, is the, the tried and true uh, pillar of, of schools. Um, you know, as you mentioned, 72% of our uh, residents over the age of 25 have at least a four-year education. So that's, that's, a, that's a pretty high number, but we have great schools here, public and private. Um, and um, both of uh, the school networks, if you will, public or private here have uh, fiber optic connections, either through the state or through the city's own private fiber optic network. So we were ready to go for distance learning, or so we thought, but, you know, until you try it, you know, it's right. like, yeah. it's, one, it's one thing to have a snow day or two. It's another thing to have three or four kids at home with a parent who is not a teacher, and you're going into day 60. You know, so, <laughs> day 60 of the snow day, yeah. Yeah, yeah 60 snow days is, is not fun for anyone. Uh, we were fortunate um, in that, you know, residents, uh, at the ballot box that, you know, have provided a tax a stream sufficient to provide one-to-one -one devices to people. Um, but even in a community as fortunate as ours, we have pockets of digital uh, inequality, and we had identified those. And one of the things we did, and, and uh, credit to, to you folks in your organization, was as part of our, you know, applications over the last two or three years, um, for recognition in the intelligent community arena was we looked at digital inequality and said, you know, we've got this, how can we fix it? And uh, we had a couple of companies locally that provided devices beyond what the schools could provide um, to graduating seniors going off to college who needed computers. We also knew that some families um, in our community had uh, parents seeking employment um, but they couldn't really do that in the school provided Chromebook or, or, or iPad. So we got computers in the right hands there to try and shore up families. And then, you know, anywhere you go, you have the issue today of reliable internet access. And while we have a private fiber optic network, at this point, it's for our business community and the limited number of residential structures that are near the network. Um, but we wanted to extend this to some of these pockets. And in the course of investigating how to do that, meeting with local utilities and so forth, we also worked with our county officials and we gained a, a community development block grant. The city helped the schools apply for it because we have grant writers. And, um, and it turned out that the best and quickest way to do this for the schools and for ongoing maintenance and billing was to use the community development uh, grant money to obtain hotspots and hand them out to um, folks who needed better internet access. Um, and they actually use one of the incumbent providers in the area. They don't use our fiber network. But this was the quickest, fastest way to solve the problem. And, uh, and a real nice uh, sort of ending to the story, it became the de facto county standard for solving this problem. Interesting. Uh, so, um, so that was good. And, and you know, I, I think we're at a real crossroads here on uh, the fiber optic uh, need in America. And this thing really points it out. The other day I was on, I was, I was watching a, a meeting like this online in a county in a state in the South where I've had, I've spent a lot of time in my life. And um, they were talking about the dichotomy in their county. 
Uh, half the county is poor and rural, and the other half touches the Gulf of Mexico. And so it is a wash in tourism dollars. Right. And uh, they've had this push pull over this within the county for years. But they said that 70% of their county did not have reliable internet access. And, you know, you can only wonder how many of those people have children and what their educational experience has been in the last few months. And as a parent, uh, you, I'm sure you'd feel the same way, Lou. You don't get a do-over on grade school, you know, or, or middle school. And I hope that this mess we're in right now spurs our country to look at building out a national fiber network, edge to edge, coast to coast, the way we looked at building an interstate system, the way we had the uh, Works Progress Administration in the 30s, the Civilian Conservation Corps. I, I think this is one of the next great opportunities. And if we took a fraction of the money we just doled out and spent it on fiber, I think the, the return on investment is incalculable. You know, I, really I, do. I, I do too, Jim. I couldn't agree with you more. Um, I, and I'm, and I'm, we've been preaching, preaching this for 20 years, so we, we don't need to belabor it. But when we talk, and you know, by collaborating with the other communities around the world, you know how, how much many of them have emphasized this type of infrastructure, and they've done it for years. And they've tied it to their educational systems, and they've tied it to their social index. And you've seen the results. Uh, I mean, Hudson, mercifully, has, you know, understood this and gotten ahead of the curve. I want to ask you about that, those Wi-Fi hotspots. Um, I'm going to assume that's one of the, the nicer innovations that have evolved from this. Um, were those, those were Wi-Fi hotspots that were put into neighborhoods? Is that how you guys did that? Yes. Yeah. You know, we, we were able, you know, we've, we've got a growing uh, data effort in the city in the last few years, and we're able to isolate the um, areas where problems existed and map them. Uh, to consider alternatives for solution. Uh, we're also able to work with various intermediaries like the schools who are very adept at adjudicating and protecting people's privacy and things like that. So, you know, we don't even know as a city who the users are and we don't need to, we don't want to. You know, the proper partners know where the need is. Yeah. And yeah, you know, we just help kind of nudge it along, and I think that's that's the way it ought to be. I do too. I think that's a that's a good fair collaboration. Um, well, I'm gonna I'm gonna get to the big question here because I can't let you know a, a, an ex Wall Street guy and a big economic thinker get away without me asking this. Um, the middle way, right? I mean, mm -hmm. everybody's talking about balancing public health with getting mm -hmm. the economy open again. Um, mm -hmm. it's, it is the legitimate discussion. It is the big one um, for you in Ohio and, and of course, um, for the rest of the nation. Have you given some thought as to how this could best occur? What is the middle way that, you know, we, it seems to me we have to follow to balance public health and get the mm -hmm. economy going? Yeah, you're on this teeter-totter where you have this epidemic and then you've got the economy at the other end and, you know, much debate. Uh, it, it, I, I believe it's become too political, but it, it's real. You know, where do you find the balance? You know, where do you even this out? Um, uh, I, I think a, a, a couple of ways. One, I view any stay-at-home order as kind of obedience training. You know, um, we've all been practicing by someone else's rules for a while now. And one of the ways, uh, or the imperatives now, is to, is to put that to work, right? You know, I mean, I, you know, we're, we're all puppies for a month or two, and now we get to go out in the yard. And, uh, and we have to go out in the yard because we can't stay inside. And I think that, um, you know, that's the benefit of closing down for a while. Um, some people, I think, will perform better than others. Um, and, you know, that's, that's left to be seen. I'm a believer that it doesn't matter what's open or what the date is or what type of business you are. Um, until the consumer is confident, nothing else matters. You know, so I talk to some of my small businesses and I say, talk about cleanliness every single day. Why is it safe to come to your business? 
Why should I feel comfortable as a consumer? Oh, I'll go there. That's low risk. I'll mask up, glove up, and I will go there because they're on their game. And I think you are familiar with businesses in your area that totally get this. And, um, you know, the irony of uh, the other day, the governor said in Ohio that to go in any business, you were going to have to wear a mask, period. And he went home and I think uh, he talked to his his wife and the next day he backed that off that a little bit. Um, but the sort of backlash I've seen is that people said, no, 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 that's good. Because if you have to do those kinds of things, I might go in those businesses. Right. Exactly. I, don't want, I don't want to go in the ones that, um, that, that uh, aren't being tough. Um, the other thing here is, and, and I watched your interview with my good friend Dana McDaniel down in Dublin, and he was talking, you know, given his military background about fast moving events, quick strikes, and how this was a slow roll. Every day, there's a new realization, a new rule, a new impact, you know? So I think we have to, um, we have to take this one day at a time. We really Absolutely. do. You know, there's, there's, um, there's no way around it. We're, we're doing all the things we can do here. We have uh, a couple of community grant programs. Uh, we have utility relief. Um, we're close to finalizing a city deferred loan program to help people reopen uh, with different levels of participation. Uh, the county has supported some businesses in our midst with their efforts. Uh, Jobs Ohio, the, the statewide employment economic development unit has been involved here. We've checked all of those boxes. Um, now I think it's, um, it's up to people to uh, find their confidence. It's up to businesses to help them. Um, as a city, we're looking at relaxing our rules and regulations. You know, we're, um, we're, we're, we're a popular little city to visit because we're cute, we're historic, you know, we have rules. You can't just have signs and junk out on the streets everywhere. Um, we're going to look the other way for a while. We need to. We have to be a partner to our businesses, not an enforcer. Um, so as we look to relax rules, relax zoning, um, you know, we're saying let's not replace the existing rules with a new set. Let's just be a friend, an enabler, a supporter for a while. Um, let's pretend we're having a year-long sidewalk sale. Um, and that anybody who wants to eat out in front of the restaurant ought to be able to. I mean, it's going to be cold a few months of the year here. Yeah. Um, uh, so that's not going to happen. And then I think we're already looking at what does this portend for our land codes and our zoning? Yeah. You know, it's time to update that anyway. Now, in a scant month and a half, something that was time to update, you can tear up and throw out almost. I have been thinking. Yes, thank for you for bringing that. Yes. For six weeks here. I have a four page list and this is just me and my overactive mind um, listing observations that I have um, at every level, the global or societal level, national government, local government, business, housing, education, observations as to impact why I feel that way and then what the implications are. Um, a city is a business. So give me, Jim, just give me one example from that list that there's no way you would have thought of 60 days ago, but that you know for sure, or are reasonably sure, will be transformed, that there will be something different that functions in Hudson and maybe Ohio as we come out of this. Well, we just mentioned confidence. That's everything now. Um, I think uh, we mentioned that staying at home was obedience training. Um, payment systems are going to change. You know, the way we take money. You know, Korea took their currency out of circulation. Yes. Yeah. Um, the world has moved to a kiosk, a touch screen, a credit card pad. No one wants to touch those anymore. Um, and if you do touch one, as soon as you're done, somebody comes in and spritzes it off and, and stiff arms the person behind you while they do it. Right. Um, I've taken to carrying my own pen around um, yeah. because I don't want to touch anyone else's pen. Exactly. Uh, you know, we're spraying, uh, you know, we're spraying the subways here. We've got a new oh, disinfectant yeah. that, that's good for 90 days. Now, when did you ever think the New York City subway would be disinfected and be good for 90 days? But there's something else that I suspect will continue, right? 
Well, and, and so I guess what I'd say, Lou, is I counsel businesses every single day. And uh, a city is a business. You know, I, I think I've almost worn out my welcome with my peers because I said, hey, you know, we're a business too, and we have to change everything we do. You know, the way we interact with people, our rules, our processes, our procedures. We've had, as I said, all this quiet innovation, things that we didn't think would happen anytime soon, but we knew needed to happen, and voila, they're done. You sure. know, we had, a bunch, we had a bunch of workers who were chained to desks for their whole career. A lot of them didn't even have laptops. They are mobile uh, they're a highly efficient mobile fighting force now, you know, <laughs> you know? And, and as you say, we've got ideas that have been kicking around for 10 or 15 years that you and I have been talking about for a long time that all seem now able to find their moment. Mm -hmm. We'll be seeing these things. So that that's probably the, the silver lining that, uh, that will define coming out of this. Um, There's so much good in this. You, you know, you got to look for the good things too. There's, you know, news can wear you out and, uh, and uh, yeah, it can bring you down, but there's, there's so much good. I've never seen as much family interaction, you know, as I've seen in the last few weeks. You know, it, it's heartwarming to see entire families walking together and no one has a device in their hands and all of their animals are in the walking group too. You right. know? <laughs> I mean, it's like, it's, you know, it's like, when we were kids, you know, when you laid in the weeds and blew dandelions in each other's faces, you know, and watched the clouds go by. We have time, yeah. Well, you know, it's interesting, Jim, and the last subject on that, we, we were, I was very concerned about social decline at the mm -hmm. outset of this, yeah. because we had withdrawn from each other. There's nothing I'd rather do than shake your hand. You know, I can't wait mm -hmm. till I can do it again if we ever do that. But there was all kinds of concerns, you know, on Saturday, if we couldn't go to Temple, uh, what would happen? Uh, if I can't go and talk to my doorman about the Mets, uh, mm -hmm. what, what's going to happen to me and psychologically, emotionally? But mm -hmm. to your point, we've begun to think about the we. By being mm -hmm. home and being obedient, we were collectively saying, yes, we believe the community is more important than the individual. Mm -hmm. By wearing a mask, as our friend, uh, your friend Emma from Taiwan told us in her interview, this is for the other. This is the mm -hmm. Confucian notion of the other person being as honorable as me. We've begun to relearn those lessons. Mm -hmm. So that is probably a good thing in terms of the social index. Um, yet on the other hand, we, we continuously read about people, obviously 30 million of us will probably be uh, called out of work, or are going to be out of work. Mm -hmm. People are suffering, there's no question. How is Hudson handling some of the anxiety and the emotional depression and some mm -hmm. of those issues, because they're, they're very real as well. Oh, they are. And we've seen spikes and, you know, uh, calls for disturbances and, you know, and, you know, we're, we're not immune to that kind of stuff. When people are too together for too long, it, it, it can get tough. Um, and, uh, you know, it's yeah. early on, I saw us, even in our little bubble here, um, as a city with an unusual amount of strife and disagreement, you know, the world has been a, a testier place, I think, in the in the last several years. And, you know, we were wondering about how we restore civility, you know, and, and get back to a, a general level of kindness that seemed to have been lost. And when this all happened, we quickly said, wow, I wouldn't have think this would have been the thing to be the catalyst for that, but you know maybe it can be. Now, as we look ahead, I think that um, you know things like uh, civil liberties are currently being called into question and will continue to be, and privacy, you know, as they start to figure out the ways to use technology to contain this, you know. But I, I that those those I hope will be sort of measured in because we might need to do some things to get control of this. Um, but I hope that civility starts to return. You know, we've had a tremendous outpouring of support for each other here. You know, I held up the We Are Hudson. We have Hudson Together. Yep. We have the Hudson Food Pantry. Um, there's grassroots efforts that have started to run errands for the elderly and 
anybody who needs something done. We have more volunteers than we have requests. Um, uh, a lady and her friend who started off to make 500 masks for uh, first responders um, stopped that effort after she made 7,000. Now she's in the private mask making business now, and you can yeah. get fast. You can get fashionable masks, and uh, you know um, our park system here is great, and it's been so embraced that we have like directional signs. You know, on this day you go clockwise, and this day you go counterclockwise. Um, there's a national park at our border. Uh, I think another beneficiary of all this. I hope another beneficiary of all this will be beyond fiber. Will be um, you know connectivity paths, bike routes, paths, you know, I think it's one of the first and most valuable things we can give to our residents. You know, let's get some of these trails that are lacking a connection or two built. You know, let's widen that road and put a green area in for bikes. Um, you know, again, let's, let's keep us in this good, warm, fuzzy family uh, spot we're in. And I think for the foreseeable future, anything that is outdoors, is going to be received positively. You know, fresh air, safety, um, you know, there's just so many examples. Even in a town like ours where there's a lot of gyms, they've given all their bikes and all their devices to their best customers and delivered them to their homes and put them in their homes and, and broadcast classes. Um, you know, uh, you're a baseball fan, so am I. You'll appreciate this. The Cleveland Indians a couple of years ago won 22 games in a row. Right. Uh, three of them against the Yankees, I might add. Yeah, you had and, to bring uh, that out, didn't you? Yeah. Yeah, and, uh, but they're rebroadcasting that, you know, and it's like, who would have stayed home and watched 22 baseball games from two or three years ago? You know, so so I, I'm proud of people. They've taken They've taken – you know, social discourse on themselves. And we all belong to online happy hours and cul-de-sac happy hours and, you know, drive-by birthday parties. I mean, I mean, some of this stuff is really, really cool. It really is. It really is. And again, those are the things that human beings do when they're, when they're at their most human. And when we talk mm -hmm. about intelligent communities, we are talking about activating that part of ourselves. And We've been looking at ways to do this for years. And, and as you say, it's interesting that something like this, for whatever reason, triggers it. And, you know, it's Jim, Jim as, I, as I close here, I, you bring up a great point. I always remember my parents' generation. That was the World War II generation. My dad was a, a veteran in World War II, his brothers and so forth. They always had a special bond. They always had a special sense of community, of, of otherness, they always made time for each other, irrespective of how busy they were. Uh, families were terrific uh, when I was there at, in, with that generation. And you just wonder if something like this, and the way you just so articulately described it, is the same effect mm -hmm. that we may experience in, in our digital age, in our 21st century, because it is just an innate human response to mm -hmm. something like this. It's almost as if we're being sent a message. You know, yeah, exactly. you know, you, you, you got out in front of yourselves here a little bit, people. It's not all about technology and toys. And right. there, at the end of the day, the, the sun still rises and sets on people and communities and societies. And, you know, I, I just hope we can keep this. I think that the biggest tragedy, despite the tremendous loss we've seen around the world, will be if we don't learn from this. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, it's... I couldn't. It's, it's 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 here and now, and 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 you know, credit to your organization too. You've taught us so much. Uh, you know, you people ask me all the time, well, what's all this smart city stuff and intelligent community stuff, and isn't that a lot of hot air, and isn't it hoity-toity, and aren't you special? And I, I say, you know, it's nothing more than a mirror that you can hold up and say are we thinking about things in the right way? And, you know, I look at the way you guys measure things in your indicators, and I would advocate that, you know, going forward, you might even think about adding one, and I would say if you did, it would be resiliency, you know, because, you know, I think we're going to have to look, you know, the most excited businesses I talk to now, the ones that aren't in the bunker, you know, and I'd say a third of them are, are fearing for their lives and 
you know, uh, and there, there's a big group of them in the middle, but some of them are saying they're excited by this. They said, oh, we're going to change everything we do. We got caught flat footed here and we probably can't dodge something like a virus, but we could have been so much better prepared. And I think cities need to think that way too. Mm-hmm. You know, what are we going to do to to mitigate these risks? If we can't eliminate them, how are we going to manage them? And uh, and I think that's the value in what you do. It's the value in coming together from people around the world who are intrigued by the same sorts of ideas and notions. It really is. Well, I, th- I think you're right, Jim. And when we define intelligence, you're you're right. It isn't hoity-toity. It's really a, a way of being more human. Mm-hmm. So that we can have the kind of responses that we're having now without having a, a deadly virus chasing us to become more human. So I yeah. think a great way to say it. Um, listen, I can't let you go without uh, one of these. So I'm going to say OH. Ohio. All right. Ohio. <laughs> In Hudson, Ohio. <laughs> yeah, let's hope, let's hope things like college football come back and uh, let's hope it all comes back. You know, well, we, we need to live again. And uh, it may be uh, on slightly different terms, but, uh, and I, uh, I, I hope we can do a, a top seven site visit in the fall. And uh, you, you know that we all want everybody out there in the world, all of our friends who see this to, to come to Ohio in October. You know, we're hoping it, we're hoping it happens. And, um, you know, we'll, as you say, play it day by day. But uh, Jim, I'd like to thank you for making the time to be with us from Hudson today. Um, it's been a pleasure, and, and I know it's been a sacrifice to give up almost 50 minutes for us, but it, it means a lot, and it's going to mean a lot. Great, great fun. Uh, credit to you and uh, John and Robert and Matt and Anna and everybody else who, uh, who uh, is working so hard along these lines. Thank you, Jim. Uh, you can learn more about Jim City at hudson.oh.us. The No Place But Home series is produced by ICF as a service to its network of intelligent communities around the world. A shout out to our series producer, Matt Owen. He's waiting patiently for the Mets season to begin. Um, That may be a good thing or a bad thing. Please join us next time for another conversation to learn more about what communities like Hudson are doing during this time. And you can read my weekly blog uh, on life in New York during this time of distress and we pray uh, the new opportunities to come. You can visit the intelligentcommunity.org backslash COVID-19 for that stuff. And as Jim mentioned, plans are on for our ICF annual summit in Dublin, Ohio from October 21st to 23rd, where you'll meet Hudson, Ohio, and bring together other communities from across the globe to have conversations just like this one. So follow us on Twitter at New Communities and uh, on Facebook for the Intelligent Community Forum I'm Lou Zaccarella, reminding you that there really is no place like home. Take care.